All right, let's get started then. So good afternoon, good evening, and good morning uh, to all of you, wherever you may be. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Paul Kirby, and I'm a research fellow at the LSE Center for Women, Peace and Security. I'll be acting as the chair for this event, which is co-organized with Gender Action for Peace and Security, the UK network of rights, humanitarian development and peace building NGOs who collaborate on the Women, Peace and Security agenda or the WPS agenda as we call it in shorthand. So today we'll be discussing the challenges, tensions and future directions for the WPS agenda as we approach the 20th anniversary of its founding. And the initial impetus for this discussion uh, is this book, New Directions in Women, Peace and Security, edited by Shumita Basu, Laura Shepard and myself, uh, and out with Bristol University Press uh, now, already in paperback and at a very reasonable price uh, from their website and from other online retailers. And we'll post some information about that uh, uh, book in the chat as well. So this is the last of three linked online launch events that we've had for the book. The others hosted uh, by Laura from Sydney and Shumita from uh, New Delhi. And so I thought I would begin by saying a couple of words about what we try to do with the book and why it might matter. So a first objective was to include voices and perspectives from across the world of academia, practice and activism to speak to the significant and sometimes confounding differences in how the WPS agenda is implemented, not implemented and reshaped in various contexts. So there are contributors from gender, gender advisors at the International Criminal Court, civil society advocates, women's human rights defenders and former employees of the United Nations amongst others as well as from academic researchers. And the chapters cover diverse sites of WPS implementation from the United States to Nepal and from South Sudan to Finland. Second, we wanted to explore the agenda's horizons, by which we mean those areas where the gender perspective is being applied to new domains of policy and practice. So there are chapters on climate change and migration, private military corporations, racial hierarchies and colonial legacies, arms control, and violent extremism. Not all of these are truly new issues. Indeed, some have been tensions in the agenda since its inauguration, and we'll talk about a few of those um, uh, questions today, as several of our speakers are also contributors to the volume. And finally, we wanted the collection to prompt reflection at this particular moment. In a few weeks, it will be the 20th anniversary of Resolution 1325, the agenda's founding moment document. Uh, and the agenda has in many ways been hugely successful, at least when measured by the number of Security Council resolutions and national action plans, but is also arguably more contested than it has ever been. So we are very lucky to have uh, some fantastic speakers to deal with some of these challenges, particularly as they apply to issues of climate, race, sexuality and militarism. So I'll just introduce them now in alphabetical order. So first up, uh, Tony Hashtrap, who is Senior Lecturer in International Politics at the University of Stirling. And Jamie Hagen, Lecturer in International Relations and Co-Director of the Centre for Gender and Politics at Queen's University, Belfast. And Tony and Jamie will be presenting uh, together. Then Heli Kezi Nwoha, Feminist Peace Activist and Women's Human Rights Defender from Nigeria and Executive Director of the Women's International Peace Centre. Uh, Anna Stavrianakis, Professor of International Relations at the University of Sussex. And finally, we'll have some discussant comments from uh, Eva Tabassam, who is Policy Advocacy and Communications Coordinator at Gender Action for Peace and Security, our co-organizing partner. So each will speak to their theme for 10 to 12 minutes and then respond to questions and comments from the floor at the end. Uh, I personally can't wait to hear what they have to say, but a few final logistical points before we begin. For those of you on Zoom, please use the chat box for any questions you may have for the panel. And if you're watching live on Facebook, you can leave your questions over there and they'll be passed to me. And once all of our speakers have finished, I'll try and get through as many of those questions, pose those questions to our panel uh, as we can in the remaining time. Hopefully the presentations and comments will uh, be finished within the hour and we should have 30 or 40 minutes for a more open discussion. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Tony and Jamie. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, uh, Paul, for organizing and Becca for bringing us all together and welcome everyone. 
Um, what I wanted to do was uh, give a bit of context to the chapter that we contributed to this uh, wonderful edited collection, but also to sort of think through ways in which they're linked to things we've then been thinking about since we actually sent the chapter in. So a bit of context as to where the motivation for this came about. I think we, Jimmy and I, were having conversations at one of the International Studies Association conferences a few years ago, and we said we really wanted to do something. And I think we were mainly motivated by themes of inclusion and exclusion and, you know, how um, inclusion is narrated in the context of the Women, Peace and Security agenda and what um, types of exclusions were being paid attention to because certainly as much as there's a lot of praise for the women peace and security agenda there's obviously a lot of critique as well that stems from the things that aren't actually acknowledged and um, one of the things that we felt was very obvious was um, well one of the things that we thought we might want to explore is sort of thinking about the ways in which um, WPS worked in the broader context of the international system, an international system that is defined by certain hierarchies, one that is um, defined by those hierarchies uh, and the interaction and relationship between the so-called global north and the global south and how we understood those hierarchies. We were also motivated by more practical um, agenda in the sense that uh, the WPS, or at least uh, the national action plans of the WPS, are often narrated as the ways in which different countries institutionalize the women, peace, and security agenda. And if that's the case, then you know we would expect that if a country has said, "Well, we're you know we really take WPS seriously," then they should have a national action plan. Well, at that time, I was um, on the one hand involved in consultations around a new national action plan. Uh, for Ireland, but on the other hand, as somebody who also does some research in South Africa, South Africa did not have a national action plan. So it's quite fascinating, given that you know both of these countries actually, uh, by and large, are concerned uh, around the same issues around gender equality, women's human rights, um, and have strong constitutional protections related to this. So what you know, why why would one country like South Africa, who is happy to um, espouse a, a lot of those same ideals and it still did not have a national action plan yet. Is a national action plan the defining uh, um, commitment to localizing the women, peace and security agenda? Well, in the process of exploring that, um, we went in a slightly different direction because of what we found. Uh, so we were looking at who actually has national action plans. In the first instance, most of the countries that have national action plans are wealthier countries. Uh, so most of the countries we looked at um, have had at least one, in some cases four, um, uh, or in the process of being on sort of the uh, fourth or the fifth one. And we thought that was really fascinating. So this would then suggest that these countries have definitely institutionalized the women, peace and security agenda. But how, how have they institutionalized these agendas and what are their priorities in the broader process? And this is where, in a way, we drew out what eventually became our theorization of national action plans and national action plans from the global north. We found that in the first instance, a lot of these national action plans tended to focus on countries in the global south. Now, this is very interesting because, you know, going back to the activism prior to the first Security Council resolution, the whole point of having something like a national action plan was have a national action plan for yourself, right? In the same way that you um, uh, certainly could be very well be part of foreign policy. We also thought it was quite fascinating that WP had, WPS had been linked to foreign policy as opposed to some sort of domestic practice. But what we then found in sort of looking at the language and the um, focus of this externalization of the women, peace and security agenda is a sort of reproduction of existing global racial hierarchies where the global north is seen as sort of this domain where, you know, WPS is done, we get it. And now it's time to go do it elsewhere, either by supporting uh, civil society organizations 
or in a way by determining what the priorities of um, women and peace and the women peace and security agenda would be in those countries. So we had countries that had specific focus areas. We had countries that were very generic in their um, in their focus, so they don't mention specific countries. But when you think about the things they prioritize, things like fragile conflict fragile context, um, sexual violence in war, it's very clear who they're referring to. At the same time, in the context of these countries, you know, if we were to take the United Kingdom, for example, you had, we've had instances of closing women's shelters. So a lot of women were not actually safe in the same way that they were not safe in some of those target countries. And we thought this was an interesting juxtaposition between the expectations that the United Kingdom had for um, countries it was dealing with externally and what it was willing to do internally. So here we are creating this narrative of everything is good, but actually we are putting the onus on um, external partners to be good in a way that we've uh, specifically defined. Um, in a way, to an extent, one could argue this is not necessarily surprising. But I think one of the th reasons why we thought it was important to sort of narrate this um, type of inclusion, so this is one type of inclusion, is because in, in the end, if, um, if we sort of think about global uh, knowledge practices, if we sort of uh, assume the ways in which uh, certain understandings of the WPS um, have been portrayed, we would assume that this is this should be a space uh, for some sort of um, radical rethinking of global international hierarchies. But actually, we find that uh, despite the aspirations of uh, feminists, uh, both activists and scholars, um, the, the current practices that uh, locate and uh, emphasize the importance of national action plans end up reproducing some of what they're supposed to challenge and i'll pass over now to jamie to speak more to some of the exclusions that we continue to find in the context of the women peace and security agenda all right um thanks for um setting us up so well here to continue the conversation about um you know i really like the way that the panel is posed as thinking about the third decade here, right? And so I think looking forward, right, we can um, always be looking for ways to expand um, and, and push the agenda, I think, right? So we did find um, when looking at these NAPs, um, again, something that, as Tony said, is not entirely surprising, but does need to be mapped out. And that also is along the lines of where funding comes from and sort of how that continues to produce, uh, reproduce hierarchies. At the same time, um, I think it's, you know, we're thinking about bringing a lens of racial justice and also gender justice that um, refuses, uh, refuses heteronormativity and actually looks for those who are not white to be centering some of the discussion, which is still not happening, right? This is actually still not happening. And um, we have the recent report from uh, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy talking about how actually a lot of the um, feminist foreign policy, you could argue is white feminist foreign policy, right? And so we see this, of course, we're going to be seeing this reproduced in women, peace and security. So I, coming to this from a perspective of, of thinking about sexuality, I'm thinking, what are some of the things that we need to be critical about in terms of co-optation and really actually pink washing? And that's something that um, LGBTQ human rights activists are, are, are very wary of. And it's something that I do think you, you see similar um, patterns in the ways that certain states might take up as, you see, as, we, as was exhibited in the NAPS, the ways that um, it, it's actually can be very helpful to the state to take on women, peace and security in very specific ways that are racialized, right? So instead, what does it mean to think about transformative justice strategies? And this is something that in our um, blog post as part of the Women, Peace and Security Forum, which maybe other folks who are on the panel will be talking about, and you can, maybe we could put a link in the chat box. Um, you know, that's where looking at Black Lives Matter uh, 
activism and looking at um, these uh, mutual aid projects that are emerging during, co during COVID-19, I think actually show us really exciting uh, transformative potential and the type of work that can be linked right up to peace building work that um, some of the organizations that are at the grassroots that may or may not be co-opted into national action plans are very much doing right now. So when we're thinking about um, racialized hierarchies, uh, that, that's also something that, um, you know, I'm always thinking about the way that um, queer and trans people are being excluded from this idea of a gender perspective. And, and again, I think we can see that right in uh, the framing of, of what's considered, um, you know, justice work, right, and peace building work. So I want to, I think that we've just about hit our time. But um, I do think that, uh, you know, my work is looking at LGBTQ inclusion and women, peace and security. And it's a really exciting time in terms of, you know, having outright action international on the NGO working group. And, um, you know, so while there's that progress, I think that's really important. At the same time, I there's a lot to learn from the way that the anti-gender movement is impacting both women, peace and security and also um, queer and trans activism that um, I just I, I think there's a real opportunity to, to be learning across movements in that space. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Uh, both of you, huge amount to, to think about and maybe return to uh, from that. Uh, Helen, shall I turn to you? You're ready. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, thank you, Tony uh, and colleague for your presentation. So uh, with my presentation, I just want to share um, the research we conducted around uh, gender conflict and environmental peace. Um, and one of the reasons why we focused on the gender impact of climate change is to understand how this intersects with women and girls' rights to peace. Um, there's a growing recognition of the need for the Women, Peace and Security Agenda to take into account how climate crisis poses risk to women and girls' peace and security, uh, particularly in conflict and post-conflict context. Um, so food security, water insecurity, and displacement are issues affecting women and girls due to extreme weather and climate emergencies. The intersection of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, climate change, ecological destruction and conflict or post-conflict situations also raises a number of issues. Um, we define environmental conflict um, as a social conflict related to the environment and they commonly involve conflict over access to and power over natural resources. Um, typically such conflicts have a variety of negative impacts uh, such as loss of livelihood, which in turn causes conflict at varying levels and which actually impacts on women and girls, you know, differently. Um, so in doing this, we, we did collect information in terms of in-depth uh, semi-structured interviews and focus group discussions, uh, which included uh, one roundtable held in London in January. And then we had in uh, 24 uh, in-depth interviews with practitioners, experts, academics, and activists, uh, whose main focus of work is in the East African region. And then we had four uh, focus group discussions with about um, 19 women in two districts in Northern Uganda. So in, the, in total, we had 126 participants. So in analyzing our data, we identified five major themes. Uh, one is the gendered impact of climate and environmental insecurity. The other is women, peace and security and environmental peace building, defending the resistance, environmental and women's rights defenders, uh, climate and environment related migration and displacement and feminist solutions to environmental peace building. And I'm just going to main, main, you know, highlight uh, some of the issues from each of these teams. On the gender in, gendered impact of climate change and environmental insecurity, uh, we noted from our research that extreme weather changes actually you know, impacts on women and girls in different ways. And we noticed that you know, some of these, including um, disasters such as flood, rain, landslides, and droughts, actually displace women. And during this displacement, women are usually 
um, either um, affected by uh, uh, some form of sexual violence, uh, which increases you know, their exposures to rape and other forms of violence, but also increases, you know, for example, when there's scarcity of water, women have to go and look for water. And then in that process, they're also exposed to violence. Sometimes it could be gender-based violence within the household. Um, and then we also noted that for some girls, when these issues happen, they, 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 they are not able to access education because they begin to do the work at home or when they are displaced, they change the environment uh, due to poverty and lack, they might also begin to miss education or they are married off as well. And within this, uh, women do not have land rights. So many times when land, when land is taken over from women, uh, from families, women are not part of the negotiation, but women are the ones who use the land to farm and provide food for the families, and yet they do not take decisions on it. So we observed that um, underlying gender inequality multiply the risk you know, for women and girls uh, due to gender norms and social roles and expectations on women and girls. For example, women have to go and collect uh, firewood for fuel, you know, women have to go and collect water. And then when there is flood or when there's displacement, women take up the role of caring for the family. And this in a way increases their, you know, uh, unpaid care work. Um, and yet, you know, no one is paying attention to the fact that they need to engage with them. We also find that the Women Peace uh, uh, Security Agenda and the practice of environmental peace building have developed differently. So uh, many of us who are working on WPS do not take into account the issues of environmental conflict and the ways that it impacts on women and girls. And those who are working on environmental uh, issues do not also consider the issues of conflict. So there's been that kind of um, um, silos in the way that people are working on these issues. And the Women Peace and Security Agenda has largely overlooked how environmental degradation, climate change, and energy resources affect women and girls' lives in conflict and post-conflict situations. And the fact that in some, conf some conflicts are as a result of issues of natural resources or land, you know, have all resulted in conflict. Um, the other thing we notice is that even as activists like us do work around peace building, donors usually will fund environmental issues differently and they will fund WPS issues differently. So um, getting that, those two issues connected then becomes very in, in important. We note that a lot of women have also become resistant on the environment. So we have a number of women human rights defenders who are working to defend land, um, and many of them have died as a result. So we, we acknowledge that you know, Global Witness documented at least 212 land and environmental defenders who were killed you know, defending land. And in the East African region, and particularly in Uganda, we find that a lot of women's groups, you know, informal and formal women's groups have opposed extractive industries, you know, for destroying the environment. Um, and, and because of that, they are being attacked. Um, and in all of this, the aim is for them to profile the voices of women to make sure that they're included in corporate res social responsibility projects. You know, if people are negotiating with communities that women's views and needs are included. So speaking up for women around issues of land, extractives and corporate power has exposed, you know, a lot of women human rights defenders, you know, to harassment, you know, um, uh, even though they try as much as possible to continue to advocate for the rights of women. We note around climate and environment related migration and displacement that there's been a number of displacements around countries across you know, countries and communities because of natural disasters uh, due to climate change and environmental conflict. So people leave their environments and the risk you know, for women and girls is actually higher as they are, they are exposed to exploitation, abuse, uh, including rape, you know, um, as they migrate. Um, so um, one of the issues we find out is that women take their vulnerability and subordination within them 
even as they migrate. So all the issues, are, you know, they have existing within their communities as they migrate, they go along with it, they are abused along the way, even when they are resettling, the same thing happens. Um, and within uh, that, we also find that even women and girls refugees have limited opportunities to also participate in environmental governance. So for example, where water points should be constructed within refugee communities, uh, women usually are not consulted, yet they are the ones that collect water and there's always conflict between refugees and host communities who also want to to assess you know, water and it's limited for host communities. And then when refugees have to join in, it becomes a problem and it leads to conflict. So we also tried to find out what are the feminist solutions to environmental peace building then? Some of the suggestions we got is the fact that it's important that we strengthen access to justice for communities so that they can challenge toxic waste, environmental degradation, dispossession, displacement, or a lack of environmental impact assessment in their areas. The other was to ensure an intersectional analysis where age, disability, race, and coloniality are considered and addressed, and that data include women and girls' lived experiences. Um, support movement building and uh, women and girls networks and empower communities to monitor the companies that are having an environmental impact. So you have a lot of corporates who government protects and yet they are violating the rights of women and girls, but we don't have a strong women's movement that can challenge this corporate power. The ones who are doing that do not have enough resources to be able to do that, and they do not have support, you know, across the entire women's movement. So it's something like they're doing on their own and every other person is doing their things differently. There's also the need to increase women and girls and youth participation in decision making and encouraging people to speak for themselves about their environment, including refugees, ID women living with disabilities, you know, and all the other marginalized groups, um, including ethnic minorities. There is need to guarantee that women and where appropriate girls are given a place at the table from the start of any intervention for peace building and giving space to express themselves. Of course, we know that in the mainstream peace building, we are still struggling to get women at the table, but in terms of resolving environmental conflict within communities, between corporates and communities, and between governments and communities, it is important that women, you know, there's efforts to bring women at the, at the table and also ensure that, you know, the most, the, the women who are going to be speaking are those who are most impacted by these issues. And when there's an opportunity to speak at international level, that these women are also supported by organizations, international INGOs, to go and speak by themselves and also listen to them. We had women who have innovat innovative uh, pros, you know, uh, strategies that they are trying to use to reclaim their land, to be able to ensure, you know, uh, that the environments are, uh, are safe. Uh, but some of these innovations, we don't hear about it. No one listens to them. People tend to think they know what the communities want. So it was very loud and clear that, you know, they want to be listened to and they want their strategies to be taken on board. But also the fact that, you know, um, interna the international community needs to think about when they are training women on peace and environmental conflict management that they also need to take into account indigenous methods that women have used and upscale those methods instead of also imposing you know what they might consider to be the right thing so um, in terms of recommendations is ensure women's and girls participation ensure that we undertake participatory gender conflict environmental analysis for any interventions around environmental peace building, uh, address intersectionality, support and fund networks uh, of uh, women's organizations, grassroots women's movement to be able to do this work, but also to defend women human rights defenders and environmental defenders because they really work in high risk situations and many times there are no, there's no support mechanism you know, for them to be able to protect themselves. But ultimately is to be able to address the challenge of corporate power. The international community should acknowledge and reverse the negative impacts of corporate power on women and girls' rights and the environment. Governments and multilateral agencies should ensure that the rights 
needs and experiences of those affected by climate insecurity and climate related conflict is not outweighed by the power of corporations. So there's, there's need to interrogate that power and there's need to also face uh, that power in a way that communities feel safe, you know, um, to be able to, 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 to speak up about the issues that they are facing, but also to build that strong network to get the support that is needed for them to, 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 to defend their environment. I will just close by saying that, you know, conducting that research enabled us to appreciate, you know, the level of effort that women have made um, to make sure that um, they protect their environment. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, it's fascinating. There's going to be plenty of questions about this, I'm sure. All right, our, our uh, final panelist before we go to uh, Eva for discuss and comments uh, is Anna Stavrinakis. Thanks so much, Paul. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. I'm grateful for the invitation. Um, so I'd like to make three broad brushstroke observations uh, from the point of view of a long-term student of the arms trade and arms transfers and a relative newcomer to the WPS agenda. I think the common theme between our, our talks has been making the connections between issues kind of analytically and politically, and this is, is in very much the same vein. So the first observation is that the WPS agenda needs to be more explicitly anti-militarist. Second, that this anti-militarism also needs to be post-colonial and anti-racist. And third, that weapons control needs to include the full spectrum of weapons, not just firearms, guns, or small arms and light weapons, whatever your preferred nomenclature. So the first observation, WPS needs to be more explicitly anti-militarist. Much feminist scholarship is implicitly or explicitly anti-militarist. But the WPS agenda as a whole has not been. Feminist activism in the past was more anti-militarist. In 1915, the International Congress of Women held in The Hague included the principle of complete disarmament and state control of the arms industry to remove, to remove the economic interests fueling war. And Tickner and Jackie True have an article about that very Congress. But there is no call for disarmament in UNSCR 1325 or subsequent WPS resolutions. The limited and partial exception of DDR, disarmament, demobilization and reintegration aside, uh, and the uh, presence or the uh, addressing of small arms and light weapons issues uh, in some national action plans. What I think has been happening is um, a, a narrowing of prevention, and this is um, this is sort of an observation that has been made about the WPS agenda um, by others, including by Paul, that there has been a, a narrowing of prevention to mean the prevention of certain types of violence in conflict that has already started, rather than the prevention of violent conflict per se. So it's become a much more kind of circumscribed, narrowly parameterized um, set of interventions. Now, my read of that narrowing is, is kind of twofold. One is, um, sort of the geopolitical and ideological conjuncture of the post-Cold War, the, the end of the Cold War and this kind of post-Cold War optimism, the relative disappearance of sort of what was formerly known as the peace movement, uh, the rise of new wars, human security and different types of security talk, combined with a kind of professionalization and concomitant disciplining of activism such that demands are being kind of funneled down a much more sort of narrower politically palatable um, set of, of routes. There are exceptions to this, of course, um, sort of uh, the example of WILP, the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom is one that stands out. Um, but I think that as that general tech trend is true. So I think the WPS agenda could usefully expand on the capacity of feminists to make these broad anti-militarist demands that refuse to accommodate the state and capital's logics of military production and circulation and reflect on how it is that the WPS agenda ended up this way, like what are those disciplining effects? That means we talk about some things, but not others. However, and this is what takes me to the, to the second observation, we can't, we mustn't hark back to a golden age of feminism or necessarily accept these anti-militarist demands uncritically. And here, I think this is where we have the most to learn from post-colonial scholarship and from anti-racist scholarship and demands. <clears throat> 
because we know that feminist activism has long been very, very awkwardly and ambivalently bound up with racial, imperial and post-colonial politics. The articulations between gender, sexuality, race and class were central to the growth of empire and industrialization that generated the international arms trade in the form that it has become today and so on. More contemporaneously, Amina Mama and Margot Okazawa Ray help us understand that what we might think of as new wars, quote unquote, are better understood actually as post-colonial conflicts. And that the way forward is for feminist theorizations of what they call post-colonial militarism. So an insistence on keeping that concept front and center to emphasize the significant continuities between colonial and contemporary forms of militarism and that the physical and structural violence at stake is fundamentally gendered as well as racialized. And so I think that sort of argument helps us think critically about the, the kind of the implicit assumption that weapons circulation and use are necessarily militarizing and therefore bad and, and to, be, um, to be reduced. Consider two counter cases. One is the women's protection units, the YPJ, that have been militarily active in defense of Kurdish national self-determination for whom, and I'm drawing here on Dilar Dirik, there is a distinction between statist, colonialist, imperialist, interventionist militarism and necessary legitimate self-defense. Consider also the United States of America, where black women are turning two guns in significant numbers, which suggests, according to Kimberly Crenshaw, that black women are under siege, and that's a quotation, not just as black people, but as black women at risk of both state violence and also interpersonal violence. And if we're thinking about uh, guns in the United States, the post-colonial dimensions are, are, are central. The US itself has the highest levels of gun violence in the global north, with gun violence more on a par with the southern parts of the Americas than with the European countries with which the US is more commonly associated. And that violence is not only gendered, but deeply racialized and whose contemporary manifestations bear the ongoing traces of settler colonialism and slavery. So you may be familiar with the fact that women in the United States are 21 times more likely to be killed with a gun than women in other high income countries. But what we also need to remember is that it is black women and Native American women who are more likely than white women to have a firearm used against them. So these gendered harms are always already racialized. And yet domestic gun control is excluded from multilateral efforts to regulate small arms and light weapons. And note the difference in nomenclature, right? When we're talking about the US, it's gun control. But on the international stage, it's small arms and light weapons. We have different terms as if they're like talking about different artifacts, but the terminology differs according to which policy forum you're, you're, you're in or which country you're talking about. Or So domestic gun control is excluded from these multilateral efforts significantly, but not solely, but significantly because of United States government demands. And this is kind of sometimes presented as an unfortunate intrusion of politics into kind of otherwise effective human security practices. Oh, you know, well, you know, it's the US, what you're going to do? Well, I mean, what are you going to do? Because it's, you know, the world's largest civilian gun market. So I read this as, as, as not an unfortunate omission or an unfortunate intrusion of politics into something that is otherwise should be kept out of politics. It is a constitutive absence. It is a deliberate omission on which wider action is predicated. What do I mean by that? I mean that by not talking about gun violence in the United States of America, not only allows policy to not address the racialized and gendered harms of guns within the United States, it also allows policy to obscure the fact that the US domestic market is actually the source of many of the illicit weapons that are found in Latin America and in Caribbean states that those states are then trying to address. So a variety of states that have themselves become extremely violent through their historic and contemporary relationship with the United States, either through slavery, through incorporation into the global capitalist economy, um, through current arms trafficking routes, those states kind of variously either want to be able to better control weapon circulation, but are held hostage by an international system that won't allow them to talk about it, or their state forces are themselves complicit in much of this weapons trafficking and much of this arms, um, armed violence. 
And that takes me to my third and final observation, which is that in giving you these examples, I have fallen into one of the traps that I think much contemporary arms um, control and WPS activism falls into, which is focusing predominantly on guns or small arms and light weapons. So my third observation is that we need kind of greater attention to the spectrum of weaponry and the different forms of gendered and racialized harms that they generate. So to be clear, there's much to be said for uh, the increased focus on small arms and light weapons or guns uh, since the end of the Cold War. This famous saying that small arms and light weapons are the real weapons of mass destruction, the centrality of guns to the gendered forms of everyday insecurity, the kind of fine grained empirical analysis that we've seen out of much of this scholarship. Like, I'm, that, I'm, I think those are all real, real benefits. But if we're interested in the pernicious effects of militarism, we also need to talk about the wider spectrum of weapons and also their militarizing effects outside of their direct use. So for example, Karen, Carol Cohn showed us over 30 years ago, the centrality of masculinity to nuclear weapons design in ways that you know, continue to, to haunt us today with the way uh, that President Trump talks about nuclear weapons, to give just one example. There has been some discussion in arms control and anti-militarist circles of the targeting of military age males by drones as a gendered human rights violation and sort of with a uh, specific focus on, on masculinity. And weapons, as we know, can be used to facilitate as well as commit violence. There is also a deeply gendered political economy of weapons production. So gendered assumptions about what industry should be producing, what constitutes a good or a skilled job, the opportunity costs of military production, when we know that climate change and pandemics are the two most significant threats to peace and security, which themselves had, have gendered effects. So that's my final point, that the WPS agenda uh, could also usefully consider the spectrum of weapons, the global systems of weapons production, circulation and use from nuclear weapons through major conventional weaponry to small arms and light weapons that are based on relations within states and between states that are both gendered and racialized and an international system in which the legacies of colonialism and decolonization still resonate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, just before I turn to the final speaker to say that if you have any um, questions that are percolating or that you, you, you're coming up with, uh, the next sort of 10, 15 minutes would be a good time to put them in the, in the chat box so I can collect them uh, for discussion. Before we turn to that wider discussion, uh, Eva Tabasam from uh, GAPS has some comments to add. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you, Becca and the LSE, for um, allowing GAPS to participate and co-host this event with you today. Um, it's been really interesting listening to the range of views from today's speakers, and I think what it shows is that the WPS agenda can find new ways to be self-critical, ambitious, self-aware and very flexible to existing and new challenges and as well as that but also making the connection to the other agendas as we've heard from all the presentations whether that is race anti-militarism and the environment but what we're seeing and sometimes what we what the what what risk there is is that we run into the practice of the wps agenda being run by this one idea which is securitization. And I guess I just want to stress a couple of things that come from the GAPS experience or the GAPS perspective working with, within Women, Peace and Security and women rights organizations globally is that, yes, there are tensions within Women, Peace and Security and there are contradictions and challenges, but we really do need to think through the ways that the WPS agenda can actually be implemented effectively. And we should be open about that and we should have more discussion and dialogue, practitioners and academics together. So I mentioned the securitization. Some of us are aware, we need to be aware that the securitization of WPS agenda by certain actors and that we shouldn't, we should also not forget, as Anna mentioned, that yes, the origins of women, peace and security, going back to 1915, in that it was anti-militarist with women and peace at the centre. So the risk of 
women, peace and security becoming only about aspects of state security agendas. So an example, um, if we look at the current Jordanian National Action Plan, which is the first fully funded National Action Plan in that implementation, that money put aside for implementation is in that NAP, which on the face of it is great. But when you look a bit closely, it's a clear example of Jordanian and donor state security objectives. And the UK is one of the donors. Um, the NAP has four strategic uh, objectives. And one of those four strategic objectives is the participation of women in preventing radicalization and violent extremism. Our conversation gaps with women on the ground revealed a completely different set of priorities. So then we ask ourselves this question, like how did the theme of pre preventing counting violent extremism become so dominant in the NAP? How does this happen? And I guess that brings me to my second issue that I want to quickly just touch upon is funding, which has been also an issue that's been raised by uh, the panel, the speakers on the panel today, because funding and sources of funding do shape agendas, whether that's a government pushing security interest or INGOs uh, pursuing particular lines. It does mean that sometimes donors voices and their priorities become more important than those women rights organizations who are actually doing the work on the ground. And that's kind of coming uh, across clearly from the presentations today. And that's something collectively that we should all be engaged with in, in, in resisting. And that's, you know, we, we are all, we, we all seek and use donor funding, but we just can't let it dictate us. And that also applies to gaps itself. Even though we might take project funding, for example, from the UK government, doesn't necessarily make us an arm of the UK government, but our role as a civil society network working on women, peace and security is to hold the UK government to account on their WPS commitments and also push for them to make their obligation to WPS a real in the UK and not just them telling other countries what to do in terms of women, peace and security. It's not just an international agenda, it's very much domestic agenda too. And as Tony and Jamie touched upon in their presentation and the chapter in the book talks about in terms of architecture, politics and funding of the NAP. And I guess the final thing that I wanna to stress today is implementation, implementation, implementation. Now I know I sound a bit like Tony Blair, but in this anniversary year, we at GAPS made a very conscious decision that actually what was needed was not any new policies or new literature, but actually take a step back and reflect and focus on implementing what we already have and what we already know. Because one thing that we know from women rights organisations that we work with, and in fact, GAPS did a round of consultations in 2019, uh, with women rights orgs globally is that yes there are loads of WPS commitments and that's great but there's no actual real meaningful implementation of the agenda in its whole. Those um, women rights orgs that we consulted fed into the 10 steps report which was turning women peace and security commitments to implementation. One of the main um, kind of findings and conclusions was that a big help to progress would be forms of funding. Forms of funding that are flexible and that reflect their own priorities. So it, it, what's coming across from, from what I'm saying, and I guess from what the, present, uh, the other speakers are saying today, is that there is a challenge of implementation that is tied up with issues of funding and who sets that agenda and who is doing the funding. And I guess when we look to the next 20 years, uh, the future of WPS, we just hope that it's women rights organisations and civil society orgs that are the driving force of the agenda and it's their voices that are heard over donor priorities. And I think that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Eva, and to everybody for keeping the time. We have just over half an hour um, for, for a wider discussion. There are a couple of questions already um, in, the, in the chat and also passed over from um, Facebook and I certainly have 
a number of points that I want to explore in more detail as well. So if I begin with a couple of those uh, and others can continue to add questions to the comment box as we go. So we have one um, question which is specifically for uh, uh, Jamie, for Dr. Hagen, which is how is um, UNSCR 1325 or the NAPS translated at the grassroots level or implemented in a way that resonates with the realities of LGBTQ and grassroots, especially in conflicted, uh, conflict affected communities where homosexuality is illegal. Uh, and there is a clarificatory comment um, from the Centre Director, Sana Mandalini, who writes, for the record, disarmament was a big priority for those of us who were advocating for 1325, and it was prominent in the civil society draft of that resolution, but it was largely erased in the governmental negotiations on the final draft. But we cannot talk about WPS in a vacuum. We've been operating in the era of the forever wars, the war on terror, and an American foreign policy feminist community that is not anti-militarist or even pro-peace. Uh, and in the US, in particular, the WPS agenda has become a women and security agenda with the peace element uh, removed. Uh, and a question that, that also addresses the area of arms control, uh, climate change, different kinds of conflicts and how they intersect comes from Abhishek Sharma, who asks, what do you think about how the climate change effects, like increasing water crisis, especially in Southern Asia, can increase the risk of countries like India, Pakistan, and China, three nuclear weapon states confronting each other and the need to bring climate change as a variable when assessing the risk of nuclear escalation as opposed to traditional threats. So one of those for Jamie, who might want to go first and then others can um, let me know if they want to answer either uh, uh, Sanam's point uh, about WPS in the US or the question of the intersection between climate crisis um, and potential nuclear conflict. Jamie? Sure. So I was that maybe it was a question that was on Facebook. I'm not actually seeing the question, but I think I think I got what the question is. Um, first of all, I think that's a really great, great question that we don't really have the answer to in a lot of places. But I will say um, women, peace and security is always a uh, is always addressing the needs of LGBTQ people, whether or not they're doing it well is, is a different question. <laughs> so, you know, lesbians are women, right? So if the women, peace and security uh, space is uh, uh, the agenda that's tasked with um, prevention of gendered violences and inclusion of, of diverse genders, well, I mean, it's not written into the resolutions, diverse genders, right? But um, I would argue that there is, room and also we have examples of um you know in colombia being the one that's being pointed to a lot but also we we've seen this in national action plans in nepal and there are um other examples where um grassroots organizations do take the initiative to link up with um those that maybe are doing more explicitly women peace and security work but um I think especially to the point about what about spaces where there aren't rights um, where one could be openly identifying you know as an lgbtq organization i think that's where outright action international comes in um, and can help offer a link the reality is that sometimes and i think we are seeing this with some of the questions that are coming up about like you can't look at the document and you can't necessarily look at the high level of what's called Women, Peace and Security to see the grassroots representation of what Women, Peace and Security is. So I would argue that, um, you know, definitely lesbian act activists and um, queer and trans activists have been part of this work from the beginning, whether or not they were identifying as such and felt like they could take a lead and take on that title is something else. And I think continuing to ask this question in different spaces of what does it mean to create a space where people can openly identify in this way, or alternatively, what does it mean to recognize that people cannot openly identify this way, right? Like, I think that's something else too, especially at the time when I mentioned the anti-gender movement, the reality is that you know, we can't just push for visibility and expect that in some spaces you're going to be able to create a working group on LGBTQ issues and then incorporate that into women, peace and security. I mean, that's just not realistic. But that doesn't mean that it's not part of the project. That doesn't mean that cisgender um, and, uh, you know, women peace builders can't be a part of shifting those those norms. Right. So that would be. Um, I think that we need to keep asking this question and I think we need to keep asking it in different contexts. And, and I do think that Colombia is an example where we've seen really important movement and work on this. 
Thanks. Does anyone else want to come in on the question of uh, how WPS is interpreted in the States or the, or the connections between climate crisis and respective nuclear conflict? Are you asking me to comment on that? No, no, any, any of the panelists. Okay, I was like, I could uh, imagine. Anna? <laughs> sure, yeah, I mean, so the, um, oops, now I've lost it again. Thank you, Sanam, for that, for the statement of, of the record about what was happening behind the scenes. I'm really kind of uh, pleased to hear that, but also unpleased to hear, displeased even to hear ab about the, what eventually happened to it. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think those kind of untold histories or lesser told histories of what actually what demands were trying to be made and what makes it on and what doesn't make it onto the agenda is precisely how we start to get at the contestation over this. What I what I know about the connection between um, sort of the two parts of your comment about SCR 1325, which is from 2000, and then kind of the era of the forever wars, the war on terror, when 9-11 obviously was 2001, that already in the years leading up to 1325, there was this kind of post-Cold War, that narrowing of the agenda, this kind of the rise of the new wars that is then all kind of absolutely kind of amplified and accelerated by the impact of 9-11. And I think that kind of ongoing US dominance, this kind of continual sort of reverb revolution of everything around US demands and US interests and US constituencies, I think is then kind of part of the, the challenge for, for many, many um, activists on, on a whole range of issues. And then I think on the, the question of sort of climate change effects, I think I, I have nothing sort of from empirical research to say, but I think what, what, how I would think about that is to take, not to take any of those supposed threats at face value. So to think through what are the questions we need to ask ourselves about how to understand um, security and insecurity in a given region. So how is it that um, how is it that particular issues such as border threats and terrorism, how have those become seen to be the issues and, and in what ways is climate change coming in as sort of a, a competitor issue? And I say this off the back of some research that a, a former colleague of mine at Sussex, Jan Selby, who's now at Sheffield, has done, which tries to problematize. Uh, he, they're, they're writing, he and some colleagues are writing about Syria, so it's a completely different example, but I think that the, there is a potential generalizable lesson there, which is where they say, actually, there's an sort of increased discourse now about, about climate change and water crisis being the cause of the Syrian war, and they debunk that, and they say, actually, it's, it's a really easy narrative to blame climate change for everything now. Actually, we need to be really careful about what are the kind of structural, socioeconomic, historical causes on conflicts in particular places. Um, so that we could be clear about what the, the causes of insecurity are. So that would be how I would think about answering your question. Great, thanks. Tony, Helen, Eva, would you like to add anything or shall we move on to the next round? No, I have nothing to add. I see more interesting questions, so maybe you can look at them. Great, okay, so we've got a couple from uh, Eleanor McNamee who wants to get to the heart of the tension of governments being power holders who shape the agenda through NAPS, but the necessity of NAPS as tools of accountability and transparency. At the same time, the mechanisms by which governments can institutionalize the work of WPS in massive bureaucracies. So are NAPS the best way for governments to engage in this work? And how can NAPS, if they are a helpful exercise, be better tools to advance the scope of the agenda? Uh, and Eleanor also raises the um, uh, interesting example of indigenous land protectors in settler colonial states who do work which falls within the scope of the WPS agenda um, thematically, but is not really recognized in NAPS. So if a settler colonial state were to address indigenous land protectors in their NAP, this could result in an important step forward in localizing the agenda, but would more likely result in the co-optation of grassroots movements by colonial governments. So a whole kind of set of questions there around NAPS as a, as a vehicle for the, for the agenda. Tony, do you wanna have a first go at that? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for that question. I mean, I think sort of the lens of the question underscores the complexity of this. And I think um, several issues are highlighted there. So the first thing I would say is, I, for me, I think it's difficult to say whether NAPs are the best tools or they're not the best tools, precisely because states are different. In some states, the NAP is so comprehensive, so reflective of um, 
indigenous knowledge um, is um, based on solidarities with uh, communities outside of the contiguous of the state, that it might be the best framework for implementing the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. In other cases, um, you can have states who are practicing elements of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda without necessarily having a NAP. At the same time, um, it feels that NAPs have become sort of um, an entry into sort of the club of WPS. So, you can do WPS for years and years and years, nobody really pays attention to you until you have a nap and it's like, well, well, good, you finally get what WPS is. And for me, that's not a negative or a positive because you know, there was a mandate that countries at least think about what WPS means to them uh, nationally. And uh, we've decided that naps are the way to go. Now with regards to the other dimension of the question, which is around, um, you know, what happens when we uh, encounter certain indigenous knowledges. And I think, you know, Canada is a great example of that that I come to over and over again, where there is clearly been, there are parallels between the experiences of, for example, indigenous women that would fit very well into the sort of things that Canada commits itself to in the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. We also know that there are knowledge producers and practices that would actually work really well with what it is that Canada is trying to do. And as you mentioned, they're not necessarily recognized. So there's the issue of, well, but you know, we should do more of that because it's there. At the same time, uh, if it gets, what happens if it gets co-opted? The thing is, you, we, can't, we can prejudge that. The way that I see it is that in as much as Indigenous people are Canadians as well, and this uh, National Action Plan are, is supposed to represent the sort of Canadian perspective, then absolutely those perspectives should be brought in. They should be given space and potentially the space that they're given, the agency that they're given, could potentially uh, transform Canada's own practices so that we don't necessarily have the issue of co-optation. So that would be one perspective, but I'm also an institutionalist and I know what institutions can do uh, to radical ideas. So I'm not in any way um, being naive about the, the real possibility of simply um, including this in National Action Plan and not really doing anything about it. I think you know, the beauty of um, being in uh, feminist spaces is that we have to leave space for um, those failures. I think that we learn from failure, but I think agency is very important and uh, consistent reflexivity is quite important. So I guess my, you know, my long answer to, to, to the question would be, um, you know, indigenous people in settler colonial so should absolutely be included in the process of negotiating what the national action plan is so that it's uh, reflective of the whole of the, the state um, but also so that it makes a difference in the communities that are marginalized within the state as much as the aspirations for those communities outside of the state. Great. Eva, did you want to add something on, on NAPs and accountability? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I pretty much agree with much of what Tony has said and also that like National action plans can be one way of implementation of the WPS agenda, but it doesn't have to be the only way. And national action plans are only as good as the process that forms it. So if you have meaningful consultation, and I mean proper meaningful consultation, I think it was only the last national action plan that the UK government, and correct me if I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, was the only time that they actually had fully funded meaningful consulta consultation with women right orgs. Um, which then hopefully that should feed into a national action plan. But then you're always, you, you know, that tension that we will have is that you will always have state security interests and agendas feeding through. But we do need to have this conversation and we do need to push back as civil society and try and get our advocacy asks through, through as much as we can. Um, yeah, that's all I have to add. Great. Helen, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, just uh, basically to add that, you know, the experience that um, we have here in Africa, 
um, and Uganda particularly is what Eva was just talking about, you know, the extent of consultation and the different groups that you engage with. So while uh, the National Action Plan looks like a bureaucratic government process, depending on who is supporting it, usually UN women, um, there's always room for consultation with civil society, with other actors who contribute, you know, to implementing the National Action Plan. Um, so I see it um, as a tool, one, to ensure the implementation of the different pillars. Um, I see it as a tool to engage with emerging issues, issues of climate change, issues of um, violent extremism, you know, issues of refugees, because then when you have these different levels of consultations, then you know what is needed for you to be able to achieve the WPS. So when government engages with these, these different groups, different perspectives come in. Um, however, it is also a tool for fundraising, you know, for governments, because many times governments are not funding the WPS. They are depending on these donors. So that also brings some kind of contradiction and contestation where we're talking about um, countries in, in, the, in the north that are having national action plans that are focusing on implementing WPS in, you know, <laughs> you know in, in, in the developing countries you know, because they are also not funding it themselves. And despite the fact that there's been a lot of push for countries to take responsibility to fund the WPS agenda, they are not prioritizing it. Instead, they are prioritizing their national security. They are prioritizing funding governments to remain in power. They are funding electoral processes, which turn out to be violent, you know. So they, they, it's, it seems that the vision for everyone is different. So basically what Tony is saying, you know, what is the vision for the WPS uh, for, for the different countries and how do they continue contextualize this in terms of how they want to achieve it. So it depends on the country, the context where they are operating. But I think that the issue of inclusion of different groups depends on the extent to which you know, consultations have taken place. Um, and then uh, the issue of accountability is another one. So the way that the WPS was conceived on, in, in the Security Council does not call for accountability. I mean, there's no reporting mechanism like we have with CEDAW. Uh, and so uh, it's, you just report. So we do have monitoring reports just to, to gauge the implementation. Uh, but what is happening is that um, at the African Union level, the Office of the Special Envoy has also developed a continental resort framework that then calls on countries to report on what they have done around the WPS. So that becomes like a monitoring mechanism to hold countries accountable. But accountable to what? If they don't do it, there are no sanctions, there's no punishment. So again, it all looks like, you know, bureaucratic things we just want to be doing. So the question would be, after 20 years, how do we strengthen accountability to the WPS? It seems to be something that you know, we'll continue to struggle with even as we are moving forward after 20 years. Great. We've got two more questions which are also about the kind of national implementation levels. So I'll take them together and maybe we can circle back um, uh, to anything that hasn't, that hasn't been covered. So one is for everybody, uh, a big question from uh, across at Facebook. How do we take 1325 forward in post-conflict countries where the government has failed to address transitional justice? and in a context where there are no NAPs in place. So I don't know if this uh, questioner has a particular context in mind, but how do we uh, uh, tackle transitional justice issues in the absence of a NAP? Uh, and then a specific question um, for Anna, but that others may have views on um, from John, which is the UK is one of the world's biggest arms traders. How do we leverage this to help WPS objectives whilst increasing the level of trade that we do? And please bear in mind Brexit when answering these requests. Okay, uh, do you want to start with that, Anna? And, and then we can talk about transitional justice. Sure, sure, thanks for the question. Um, I suppose I'd want to kind of query the premise really, which is because for me, it's not obvious that you can, if you're serious about WPS, that you would want to increase the level of, by trade I assume you mean arms trade, um, because thinking about the WPS agenda, which bits of that agenda are, can be harmonized with um, increasing UK arms exports? Um, because to my mind, I mean, you could talk about like increasing women's participation in the arms industry, but to, that's a very kind of liberal argument akin to let's increase women's participation in the military. Well, to what end? 
Um, so a kind of anti-militarist account of that would be like, uh, actually, no, we need less arms production, especially in the UK, where all the kind of economic arguments are, are very heavily disputed and the, 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 the economic advantages of, of um, increased arms exports are not at all obvious, along with the kind of these gendered assumptions around what constitutes a strong economy and good jobs and so on. Um, I think Brexit is only going to make it worse not least because the UK is now prioritizing even further its arms trade relationships with Middle Eastern countries um, where they together in tandem have contributed to um, kind of the, the sort of terrible state of affairs um, for women in those countries. When I think about the example of Yemen, which is the one that I've worked on most consistently over the past few years, I just had a quick look, I just had a quick Google of, you know, UK, Yemen, WPS. Now the UK government is assisting Yemen with its national action plan great you're also bombing the helping bomb the shit out of them excuse sorry excuse my french it i get quite angry about this it, it's not it is it this kind of left hand right hand oh but you know we're giving them loads of humanitarian aid and assistance we're going to help them with their nap right but also how about you stop perpetuating gendered harm through supporting a coalition that is engaging in airstrikes is engaging in an economic blockade and is starving the population into submission so to my mind, the kind of the premise of that question, it assumes a lot of things about, um, about arms exports that actually I think, one of the things that I find really interesting about the UK is that each of those the steps of that argument that they're good for the economy, that it's good for our security, that, it, that we have leverage, that it builds influence overseas, each of those is kind of really easily disprovable. So that actually they're ideological constructs rather than anything else. And that's what I find so interesting about the UK case, that we are stuck in this very kind of, white upper class male understanding of what security is um, in, and it, it, in ways that kind of it has this sort of ideological baggage way in excess of anything that it might actually mean, especially if we're talking about something like WPS. Great. Does any other speaker want to indicate if they want to uh, go to the question about transitional uh, justice and how to pursue uh, 1325 in the absence of, of a NAP? I could, sorry, I was just thinking uh, off the top of my head, I mean, I'm less familiar with the processes of transitional justice compared to other uh, processes, but I mean, from my perspective, again, uh, going back to, you know, what, what are NAPs for and what is the process? You can have a really fantastic NAP on paper that means absolutely nothing, um, or you could have a really great um, post-conflict settlement that considers a uh, gendered rights and all of that. And the idea is that, you know, once we build the institutions that will facilitate the sort of consultation that Helen was talking about, then we then develop a NAP. Because of course, the question I would have is, you know, who gets to develop the NAP if we require that we have a NAP before we can do any sort of transitional justice? Um, so I would question the idea that we, have, we need a NAP to implement any part of 1325. It would be great if we could arrive at one, one that is comprehensive, one that is uh, reflective of the agency of both the most marginalized, but also quite inclusive, um, and one that engenders um, the sort of forms of participatory democracy that can be emancipatory to the population of that particular space. Uh, so yeah, I would say maybe it's not essential um, uh, for transitional justice to happen, but uh, perhaps there are other intervening variables as to why you don't see the sort of transformation that we would need for the kind of post-conflict settlement that is necessary. Helen? Yeah, so um, because of the way that um, transitional justice processes take place, uh, many times you find that you would require an independent uh, transitional justice policy uh, because it has a lot of implications for justice, for the legal system, you know, for uh, reparations um, and all those different processes uh, that actually you can address transitional justice without really having a nap. Uh, it depends on how the, the, the state the, the post-conflict state or the conflict state um, and actors within it, you know, uh, conceive the issues of transitional justice, reconciliation, and the rest. Um, 
um, in northern Uganda, for example, the, the processes of reconciliation um, uh, and amnesty was going on, you know, while the lab, you know, was still being developed. Um, so, uh, in many cases, you know, uh, because transitional justice is is seen to be broader, um, you know, the scope. Um, and while women, peace and security issues are actually part of it, um, many people have developed the transitional justice policies and laws outside the WPS agenda, you know, or plan. But like Tony was saying, if we have a WPS plan that is broad, is more comprehensive and takes that into account, that would work. But because a lot of times there are different actors uh, there are different ministries handling these issues. And again, the issues of donors, you know, uh, picking what they want to address also kind of makes this breaking down some of these issues into different segments that then also makes it difficult, you know, for one to pull everything together and be able to have something more holistic and comprehensive. So yes, it's possible to do that, but it would be more effective and efficient, you know, if we had one plan that kind of engages with everything and then everyone, you know, because everything is kind of connected um, when you're talking about that, um, yeah, but you know, um, yeah, so the answer for me would be yes, you can do transitional justice without having a national action plan. It's like a lot of people, including the US, used to say that they don't need a national action plan because they have all the policies on WPS issues and, you know, those kind of excuses. And the same thing that was also happening in South Africa, but this year they've already developed a national action plan. So it's to get countries to understand why we need the plan because it pulls everything together and then it's easy for you to then also monitor its implementation, but see how they are connected in terms of addressing the issues of, you know, women, peace and security and other issues, uh, you know, all the issues around it, issues we are talking about climate change, um, issues of, um, of uh, um, arms and then issues of uh, LGBTIs and all those intersecting is in intersectional issues. Yeah. Great, Jamie. Yeah, and I think this is um, in some ways along the lines of the similar co the question about sort of how do we how can we be promoting and supporting LGBTQ voices, queer and trans voices, and women, peace and security because. Nope, none of the resolutions say, and also LGBTQ people, and also international queer, right? You know, like that's not written in the agenda, and so many of the topics that we've talked about aren't written into it. But I think I'm trying to think queerly about this, right? So both and I think that in some spaces we're actually reaching a point where there's the risk, especially at a time when um, maybe the U.S. is talking about having a feminist foreign policy, and I and. I, <laughs> that's a little terrifying to some people. <laughs> to some people it's seen as great progress. <laughs> and I think that um, there's, in all of this, it of course has to be very context specific what work women, peace and security with, you know, capital WPS can really do. And I think that we've seen from the legacy of CEDA and, you know, coming through the grassroots to develop this agenda, um, having gender talked about in spaces where it wasn't before is really transformative. At the same time, when I imagine working with queer organizations, do I really think the most, the thing that they need the most is to be at the center stage of the Security Council? I don't know. I think there's some that would argue, no, thank you very much. We're experiencing severe backlash at the moment, and please just give us some money to continue to support people who desperately can't access basic health care. And that is also part of women, peace and security work, I would say, but whether or not we, um, you know, and that's transformative justice work, transitional justice work. And so um, I think we, of course, need to continually uh, I, I just did my week with my gender and politics class about thinking beyond binaries. <laughs> and so I'm thinking through that um, in, in how we're able to, you know, remain critical, but also, um, you know, find the context where it actually really does work to mobilize through women, peace and security and, and other places where there's different forms of transitional and transformative um, approaches to justice that that work more successfully. And the Columbia example is actually really a powerful one for that because in some ways it was, you know, the first space where we have the gender subcommittee and you have 
um, this inclusion of, of queer and trans voices, and then you have a really, uh, you have the defeat of, of bringing this forward to the people and, and um, we see this backlash on, on gender inclusion. So I guess um, as we've kind of talked, uh, so many of us have pointed to, there's the co complexity here of um, what women, peace and security can do to do for us and then how we can remain critical and continue to connect in, in other uh, spaces for this uh, gender justice work. Great, thank you. I think we have time for a final round of questions. Uh, connected by this this issue of of donors and and funding and who the actors that get included in the agenda are, so one of the more specific UK questions is how can funds like the Conflict Security and Stabilisation Fund, which already have to ensure that any funding includes WPS, do more or go further with reaching those WPS objectives, particularly when working with other countries. Uh, to uh, add to that, Natalie Hudson asks. All speakers address the challenge of funding and in the space we usually think about funding from a state-based donor perspective. To what extent has the private sector affected WPS implementation and what role do you see for public-private partnerships which we are starting to see in spaces including the SDGs and increased reliance on the private sector. Um, and if I can piggyback on that, I had a, a, a kind of question or an interest in that several of, of you were speaking about private actors. Right, so whether it's uh, arms companies or uh, corporations that might be involved in environmental degradation. In the book, um, we have a, a chapter thinking about private military contractors, these entities that sometimes fall outside or oftentimes fall outside the scope of WPS, which can be more focused on the state or on UN sort of peacekeeping, peacekeeping missions. So if any of you have thoughts about Kind of private actors and whether they can or should be brought into WPS in a different kind of way that might be worth touching on uh, as well. Uh, Eva, did you want to start on the Conflict Security and Stabilization Fund question? Sure. Um, so GAPS was involved with, um, was involved when CSSF was uh, established and we pretty much pushed the UK to integrate gender and um, also really pushed for them to keep a track of women peace, the spender on women, peace and security. And um, as well as having a specific uh, pot of funding for WPS, uh, which now the UK does. But I guess what is essential and that needs to happen to all CSSF programmes is that they need to integrate gender. So there's no point, for example, if you've got a WPS programme here in Somalia and then, but, and then women and girls aren't actually asked what the programme about what they want the program to do for them and then you've got a, a security sector reform program in Somalia as well but that doesn't look at all at gender but just looks at beefing up their own existing security services so to provide proper um, peace and security to women and girls gender has to be integrated across so it's great what CSSF is setting up and is doing but it does need to go further to ensure that gender is integrated as a whole across the whole department. Otherwise, it's working in silos and then one part of the programme that doesn't look at gender might be undoing all the good work, for example, that another part of the WPS programme will be doing in the same context. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Anna, thoughts? It's half baked. So I think so my general instinct on, on things like this is around, and it sort of links to one of the comments that was put in the chat that was about window dress, being used as window dressing. But I think this sort of, the questions about how do we make sort of WPS specific funds go further, where, how, what other sources of funding can we draw on? I think for me, sort of the question would always be what are the, politics of the agendas being advanced here like is it you know i often think this about you know work trying to boost the hand of kind of the human rights people in the foreign office um the gender advisors within what was defeated sort of trying to boost their hand at, but and then you sort of get this sort of cottage industry of 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 trying to get funds to support them and actually there's kind of all this energy and all this activity and all this fundraising to do those things in ways that are so structurally asymmetrical that actually what would happen if we all just withdrew 
Like if we all just withdrew and said we're not playing. And I recognise that's a completely untenable position. That's why I'm an academic and not anymore an NGO worker, right? I get it. But, it, but I think it's, that's one of the things that it cut, it will, this will cut across all the issues, right? Whichever issue it is you're, you're working on. So I think I, I find it very hard to answer those sorts of questions. Because I think the terrain of the, of the game that we're playing, even though it's far too serious to be again, the, that terrain of the game is so, is so asymmetrical that I think we need to be having sort of more political conversations just about, about withdrawal and protest and, and things that don't necessarily cost as much money. I don't know. That's probably not that helpful, I'm sorry. Helen, Tony, Jamie? Um, I mean, I, in a weird way, I kind of sit in between Eva and Anna because I think my instincts are more uh, perhaps to go with Anna. But at the same time, I know that um, lots of civil society organizations, as we sort of saw in our chapter, do rely on support from projects that are coming from the um, UK government. So on the one hand, I, I, I think I would agree about, yeah, we should actually just refuse that. But we also know that until we can find another system, we live in a very capitalist one where money does make a difference. And um, in some communities, it's the difference between life and death. Um, though, I don't know if there's a way around it in terms of um, getting more WPS. So there are the options that Eva has mentioned. But at the same time, I'm often quite weary, particularly of that instrument of that particular instrument and the tying of um, WPS or any sort of gender equality practices to a uh, foreign policy self-interest objectives. And I don't think you can get away from that. I, I think that of course you can have advocates um, within civil society in the UK who might try to push uh, and to get, you know, a, one program that is perhaps not as constrained by um, UK foreign policy uh, imperatives. But I think in the grand scheme of things, it will always be constrained. So it's a, it's a catch 22. On the one hand, you might need the money um, quite desperately. Uh, but on the other hand, you are also playing, uh, to use Anna's term, the game, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I will also say, of course, I have the luxury of noting that because I'm an academic and, but, you know, actually, we're all uh, implicated as well, right? We're all applying for GCRF and we're, you know, we're, we're trying to find funding to do this research because we care. It's not just because you just want the funding, but I think it is important to be reflective about the broader implications of um, engaging um, in this way. So no answer to that particular question, except I think, I think we can all agree that we're all very optimistic about what it is that those sorts of instruments can do. But we also live in a world where uh, in our different contexts, we have to make our peace with those types of instruments. Indeed, Jamie? Yeah. yeah um... I'm just lots of nods of agreement and also thinking through the lens of um, the challenge of, I think about how the images of women, peace and security are often, you know, more women in the police forces we've already talked about, or the, you know, and, and when you've got a lot of really powerful abolitionist organizing and, and movement thinking right now, the idea of walking into the room and you know, handing over one of these, <laughs> you know, women, peace and security reports with, you know, women in fatigues on the cover of doesn't feel terribly progressive. Um, uh, yeah, so I think at the same time, we understand that the agenda is what has introduced what was entirely off, <laughs> off the radar of, of gendered vulnerabilities and insecurities. So I think it's actually uh, part of the challenge is accountability, but also the indicators of what success for women, peace and security looks like. And that comes you know, to the point about anti-militarism as well. And, um, and I do think in different contexts, people will define that differently. I mean, I, I have ideas about what it means to be really successfully implementing women, peace and security that would be very different 
from people who are facing um, uh, other forms of violences or lack of access to to justice and, and opportunities, which is very, uh, you know, very challenging to grapple with a with an international agenda. Um, so I think this is especially with the move towards localization, which is what we were trying to, you know, we're looking at with this chapter sort of so wait, how, how do we grab how do we deal with the fact that it, there's an international trying to filter um, local um, the local will, the local desire of these organizations, and inevitably, especially the funding dimension, are they are organizations telling the international what they think uh, needs to be said, or are we actually getting representation of of what progress and um, a real security, um, a feminist security looks like? So, um, and I think that you know, coming into the third decade of this, we, I mean, we have so much research so much collaboration across activism and academia, actually. I mean, I think it's one of the spaces that has more collaboration in that capacity than, than most <laughs> research. Um, and we still are, are kind of asking these same fundamental questions about, okay, wait, but what do we mean when we say security? What, what do we mean when we're saying peace? And, um, and I think uh, it's, it's really a, a persistent question that we have to be asking um, in, in different spaces to be hearing different answers and can't just have an international understanding, you know, one determination of, of what that is, which is very challenging. <laughs> Indeed it is. Indeed it is. Helen, any final uh, words? Well, very interesting conversations there. Um, but, you know, as someone who works here in Africa, I would just say that um, a lot of work on WPS is being done by women at the grassroots level uh, who live these realities on a daily basis. And many of these organizations are informal, many times not registered, most times don't have the requirements for funding, um, and yet they have to you know, take on those actions. So I think that when we are discussing these issues uh, of support, it's also to think about the power relationship between countries, power relationship between donors and uh, women's rights organizations, power relationships between women's rights organizations and grassroots women's organizations. So those different um, dimensions and levels of power and inequality uh, that happens between institu institutions, between governments, and with the women's movement and the women's peace movement and the main movement, uh, between uh, movements of LGBTI and within the main movement. So I mean, there are these different power relationship, you know, that happens when it comes to funding, you know, and who has access and whose agenda is being uh, promoted or being sanctioned by government. Uh, so, for example, in countries where you have laws against LGBTI, first of all, they are illegal, they don't exist, you know, so it also becomes a problem for them to even receive funding in the first place. And then there's also the aspect of who is working with them and, you know, what authorities do you have? Is it legal or illegal? You know, so within conflict and post-conflict situations, these different dimensions of inequality and power relationship then also puts a lot of pressure, you know, on women who are organizing around peace building. You know, so one of the things that I think, you know, I, I, I can just close with is to say that um, a lot of, uh, someone talked about private sector, you know, and government. I think peace is not an agenda for the private sector. Uh, people are thinking of, about what they can, what profit they can make from engaging, and women in conflict don't have anything to give in terms of, you know, in terms of profits to to these corporates, you know, um, so they wouldn't pay a lot of attention to that. But there's been a lot of engagement, uh, you know, to see how they can, we can interest them to contribute to this because also when there is conflict, then business does not strive, you know. So that's something that. A lot of focus, you know, has been on businesses and human rights and not really business and peace building. So probably we need to think about that, that kind of agenda, you know, that makes businesses to see why it is important, you know, to contribute to peace building. But in terms of generally, you know, um, how WPS, you know, can be supported is to look at how this funding can really get to the people who need it and who are doing the work. You know, we start really looking at those um, 
uh, those uh, regulations, you know, uh, some people ask for track records, people don't write reports, grassroots women. So there are many things they need to consider, either to pass these funds through established women's organizations who then, you know, would find it easy to get to the grassroots women's organizations, but also first to understand what the women need. You know, we just keep saying that don't assume that because your national action plan talks about violence against women and it talks about women and in peace building or women at the peace table. What is the context in the country where you want to support? Maybe you should talk to them first, hear from them. What, what are those needs that are important to them? And then try to tell all your support to be able to achieve exactly what will impact on the lives of women and girls and deal with their daily realities. I will just close with that. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much, Helen. Sadly, we are out of um, time, but I think it's been a it's been a great session, and thank you all for your contributions. So, a kind of remote digital thanks to Tony, Jamie, Helen, Anna, and Eva for their uh, contributions, and also to Becca, Zoe, Amal, and Hannah for helping uh, make the event uh, happen. And hopefully, we'll all have the opportunity to talk about uh, these issues again. So, thank you, and have a great afternoon, morning, or evening, wherever you are.